Okay, I'm Melissa, as you've just been introduced to me. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to be here in this um, exquisite b building. It's, I just think it's gorgeous, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, I like coming to Manchester, best of all, out of all the places ever, um, because this is where my parents were from and where I was born. So it's like coming home to me. So I, I love coming here. So thank you very much for inviting me. It's wonderful. Um, I'm not going to ramble on too much because I could do that all day. Um, my first poem is a new poem. It's not been published anywhere yet. Um, Blue Prelude. I listen to Nina through the wild old blizzard shedding its coat. Snow sticking to my real eyelashes, my thoughts curled up at the edges. And I'm walking and you're talking to me though you're not there not anywhere. I see two women I used to know who sour and don't smile at me. Lifetimes charge into me with the maddening gathering gale. I am not safe in my own heart. I pull my fur hood down and carry my two shopping bags filled with boxes of pre-packed fruit. Nina sings, what is love but a prelude to sorrow? A song I listened to the first day my husband kissed me. The first day I ever made him cry. My depression then was my most significant lover, my mania, my most attentive and long-standing partner. And pushing them aside, he warmed his 20-something heart in my bed slowly and holily with all the lights in my house out. If you fall in love in winter, you have more chance of sticking together. It's cold and everyone needs another to survive these bastard blizzards. John is in New York, holed up and deciding his lover's fate. I light candles and kiss my son on his gorgeous snout. The sun will set soon and I will call Sham at the studio. I need money more than I need love. I'm 200 pounds a night. You might laugh but I always put in a good performance. Steve used to say I deserved a solid, huge, round brass medal that clattered around my neck, paraded for all the world. I know he could have helped me out of this, though his soul now is as cold to me as Pluto out in space. I looked at photos of him yesterday, very much alive, the cut of his jib appealing to me, my very own Elvis. My own lowly god now with Joe and Jim and Jade and counting down the days and sunsets until I can join them. Angels. In heaven, there is no substance worth dying for and libido and ego and ear to lie back in the foggy wasteland float forever in euphoria. Souls untied and bleeding diesel and acid rain and tears and all the poisons of the wasted years and it comes down now hard on us via clouds and swelling bursts of petering out sun and our sunken appalled memories. In heaven my sweethearts are riding exercise bikes wearing sweatbands because there's nothing to do. Just to touch your skin one more time, I would get on a plane tonight in the minuses. A boat, a two-man canoe, I would shiver, fly through the airways, my voice a cortina, my breath, the breath of a Holocaust survivor. This morning I saw a picture of the last Jew to be shot down in a gaping hole and covered in European dirt and the killers laughing and smoking. Steve always overused the word trite. His politeness was of a frequency so perfect. In my sleep now, I hear him apologise for his lack of being alive and therefore not in a real house, on a real street, and too far away to call or take a black cab. Come back. I'll give you my steady hand, pull you close like we used to. Your late father's crocodile belt. I want you to beat me with it. You once put your skinny arms around me, Steve invoked him. I am a catalyst for love that has no place in this world or the next. So beat me with it, please. 
The light dims and a bare ball flicks on across the street. A girl with rickets attempts to walk up the hill past the church. Two fat women in black talk animatedly and I forget where I am. I need money. Emails from you don't come. The taste on my tongue is bitter. I remember how you smell even when I'm alone. Fully satiated, you walked around my birth town, maliciously involved with the night, hiking up her skirt. And yeah, Sharon Horgan is fit, and many women are serendipitously beautiful. The girl on the quiz show is a naughty goddess, and I'm going to write in. She's stunning, such a long white neck. If you have the time, darling, if you have the time, please write to me out of love. And if you're out of love, it often skips a generation, but I have it in perpetuum. A handbook is ideal if you feel by numbers and love by design, but I hike my skirt up and disappear into the black hole, the hole where all the lovers go, bypassing heaven for a detour of. The man across the street with his 70s haircut dances, swings and clicks his fingers and knows where I am here, watching solemnly. I like to be watched, but please don't look at me. He air drums out of sync and when he's stoned tonight, we'll watch the period drama at opposite ends of the sofa, stilted. Darling, please go down on me. You can't have two boyfriends, I tell my daughter. Pick one and stick. Why? The dead don't come back. Something's wrong, I can feel it. Like I feel the horror of recognition when someone looks happy. That was me. I, I did this. Paradise shuts down at the first sign of rhinovirus. Come into my arms. My wingspan will impress you. It's incredible, I swear it. My jeans are like so bad, but I have resolve and for 200 pounds a night, I'll give you all my love like this. I will whisper poetry, all hush and hormones and harm in your delicate ear. Um, one of my big, my big issues and concerns in life, I suppose as a parent and also as a writer, those are my two main roles in life. Um, it, my concern about things is the ability to communicate and that's why I write, um, to, to sort of express everything that you can't say in ordinary speech. And I am far better at writing than talking, though I never ever shut up, I talk all the time and um, it's all probably a load of rubbish. So the writing's important. Um, so I always thought that could be this person that could just solve any problem in the entire universe just by talking about it. And I suppose it came, this, this sort of feeling that I need to talk um, comes from this, 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 this story in my family about my, um, my grandma and her sister. And my grandma knitted her sister a cardigan one year for Christmas and then she went out in it and she went to the shop and she, would, she had a cold so she blew her nose and she put a tissue in the pocket and it was all snotty and horrible. And then she took the cardigan off and she wrapped it up and gave it her for Christmas. So the sister opened it and pulled this snot terrible tissue out and said like, what the hell is this? And they fell out, they didn't really say much to each other, they fell out for 25 years, right? And I thought, you know, I think, you know, five years is, is quite adequate for that. But, so I just think that this was nothing to do with the tissue or anything like that. It's just two people that can't communicate with each other. Um, and as we all know, when, when stuff builds up over a period of time and we're upset with people, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, so, yeah, I like talking. <laughs> that's what I do. So, I'm, I've written a poem that's sort of not to do with that at all, but it's to do with a communication breakdown. And it sort of discusses all the sorts of kinds of negotiation we have with people silently. But essentially, I don't think we can do things silently. We have to talk, we have to express ourselves. I'm a big believer in that. And all the things that we do, I could face today. 
If Disney made porn, they would have paid us well for our trouble. We share baths together because we get bored and it's cold. And we used to talk, but now I just pull sad faces and you sympathise. I was thinking about abstract things, like what distance means to love is physical distance, emotional distance, and the distance between us in the bath in our heads. I looked into your eyes, your perfect blue jay Hollywood eyes and how starved they sank. And I massaged your soft cock in my right hand. Your eyes rolled in ecstasy and I let my thumb rub the soft part and you melted into the lukewarm water like butter on a hot knife. Your cum oozed out slowly and sweetly and I licked it off my hand as you groaned. Immediately, a dozen bluebirds flew in and tidied your hair and a gentle and sprightly music soothed your brow and blew all around us like happiness. And all I wanted was forgiveness. And the cum in my mouth tasted strong and hormonal and strange. And you settled back into the bath with your flushed skin and your cock bobbing and your cum floating sadly in globules on the surface of the soapy water. You said you need to get clean and drank your Advocar. I said, Rob's getting me some MDMA for my Christmas present. He said, what are you going to do, sit in and get high? I said, no, we're going to walk around all night drinking beer and talking. I'm 32 years old, I'm thinking, and I need to come, and I need to sort my life out, my head out, my heart dilated to an apple, the core waiting to be pierced by some dumb cupid, pinning me to the one trajectory. You said I'd better rinse the bath down and watch me clean my pussy and dry my body and grow cold and silent again. I love you, baby. I love all of you. And I will never love myself. And this book is going to be a killer. It's going to suck me dry, suck me white, suck my insides out and leave me hollow and high. Do you even realise how fucking cool the full moon looks over Pendle Hill and all the rotten towns at midnight, howling and hollow? And do you even remember how good it feels not to touch on MDMA and have all that hollow love like a mouthful of wasted cum? I've never come so close to drowning, my love. The world seems so hollow from here. I've never been less sure, saturated or lonely and wet and over and beyond my head. And what if the moon's not full? And what if? Where are we going and why can't I come too? You fall asleep nestled under my arm and I want to pinch you. Cruelty being all I've got for now, effortless and brave. Is it brave of me to fall from this sad height? Or should I climb down and lie in this coffin of pain and wait for lights out? In the same sheets he slept in when he stayed at our house, laundered of his scent. I fit inside love like the breath in a flute. I will escape at the slightest pause or hesitation. You need to clasp me, need to tie me down, please. I want to go nowhere. So I'm just going to read one more poem. I'm going to read one from my book, uh, Beautiful Girls. And I wrote this poem about a woman who I loved very, very deeply, and um, she committed suicide a long time ago. And I think often about how we have these incredible, profound silences all the time between the, you know, we're quiet most of the time, we didn't do much talking. But the silences were very beautiful. They were, they, they were just so, so, so wonderful. But now she's dead, and I sort of read poems from this book, some of them about her, and all I really think is about all the things I wish I could have said to her and all the things that if she was here now, I would absolutely say to her. Um, so yeah, um, so I need to just write poems instead now for her. And that's how I communicate with her. That afternoon, we listened to Sparkle Horse and thought about dying. 
On the fourth floor, we looked out at factories, autumn's eccentricity elevating the determination of grey. We couldn't feel anything. We smoked until we were numb. I fell asleep. The baby slept an hour and a half in the pram. My head rested on your shoulder. You took my weight and held me. I'd been to the weigh and save for a cup of sugar and what little meal I could afford. You made me a cup of tea strong enough to wake me, played with the baby while I came round sipping at the steam. There was beauty in every movement you made. The earphones perpetually stuck in your ears to kill or soothe the voices. How I loved you. How I didn't care if you stole from the shop I worked in. You had sex for your fix, though you denied it, though you put your arms around me. You existed in a parallel universe I sometimes crossed over into. Your silences rolled around my tongue. They were a language of their own. We'd roll and smoke cigarettes in unison. Your neighbour had died from self-inflicted stab wounds. You recounted the story to me as though you had been in the room and smelt the blood. His girlfriend had died at the wheel of a car. She was going into labour on her way home Christmas Eve. You know, and I know, how messy life can get when you mess with it, when you push your luck. I stepped out that day with clear eyes, a creased dress, and a hankering for sex and cigarettes and hot food. But as it was, I caught the bus and had the not so fleeting thought that I might never see you again. Okay, thank you.